Good evening, everybody. My name is Abraham Sway. I am a neurosurgeon, and we are transmitting live from Mount Jordan from the Utah Medical Campus. I thought I put some paintings just to highlight the importance of the anatomy learning. And this is a painting by Rampant, 1632, uh, showing the anatomy of an adult. Another painting by Jan van Nick, in the same period from Holland, Amsterdam, depicting the, uh, the anatomy of a uh, newborn baby. We're talking about uh, 19, uh, 1691 and so on. So talking about 400 years ago, people were learning anatomy more than people learning anatomy now. I'm presenting tonight uh, my personal series of cranial and spinal ABC. This is the abbreviation of aneurysmal bone cysts. And we'll discuss that from the clinical, radiological, operative and pathological correlation. Uh, this is some of the cases we we'll present cases, cranial and cases in the spine. So what is aneurysmal bone cyst or ABC? I think if you ask any resident or neurosurgeon, he would remember ABC because ABC is easy to remember. But we have to state right now that this is a misnomer. It's a mahalat, wrong name. It is not a cyst. It is not aneurysm, it is a neoplasm. And it is not as easy as ABC. It can be very difficult. According to the WHO definition, it's a benign tumor, benign cystic tumor of bone composed of blood filled spaces separated by C septi containing fibroblasts, osteoclasts, giant cells, and active woven bone. So we're talking about neoplasm and not a cyst. Jaffe and Lachenstein, 1942, they first described this. And what did they say? Opening the cyst's thin wall, one is confronted with a large hole containing fluid blood. So it is a large hole in the bone with blood in it. It's not a cyst. This is description 1942. So you're talking about tumor. And these are the specimens that you get. Some people used to call it pseudotumor. Now it is accepted and recognized that it is a tumor. And the characteristic of this tumor that it is associated with rapid enlargement and bone destruction. Rare, indeed, 1% of all primary bone tumors. Young age, I'm talking about five to 20 years. Rarely you see it above. 30, almost equal between males and females, maybe females are slightly more, and it can affect any bone in your body. They call it primary or secondary. What is the difference? Primary, there's no bone lesion to start with, and then you develop this lesion. Secondary means there's a tumor or a lesion, and then the bone uh, cyst or the ABC develop inside this uh, tumor or lesion. What's the theory of the primary or the secondary? Just the same, there is high flow between arteries and veins. That will cause bone erosion. That will cause thinning of the cortex. That would cause bleeding and then cavities. The bone collapse and soft tissue are invaded. So we are dealing with a the, with the tumor and not a cyst. Sorry? Sorry? Yes, some people say that there is usually some history of a trauma before, if it is a primary. And the trauma is recognized as a cause of tumor, like in meningioma. This is a recognized theory of meningioma formation. Uh, these two authors, they graded into three grades, grade one, grade two, and grade three. Latent, which means we don't have much of the symptoms, and then active stage, and then the aggressive stage. So secondary ABC or aneurysmal bone cyst, as we agree that it is a misnomer. Look at this, three existing tumors like giant tumors, hematoma, chondroblastoma, Langerhans, histocytosis, 
etc., etc. There is a lesion, and then the ABC develops inside the stage. So, such lesions are fib fibrous dysplasia. So you start with fibrous dysplasia, like this, and then you develop bone and the bosses like this. Fibrous dysplasia, and then an invisible bone cyst inside it. Papers about this aneurysm developing inside fibrous dysplasia from South Korea, 2018. You can see how did it start? Fibrous dysplasia and how it ends. Aneurysm and bone cyst inside it. Another paper from Brazil. Again, combination of fibrous dysplasia and aneurysm and bone cyst. From Korea 2010, the same thing, a lesion containing both elements, fibrous dysplasia and aneurysm and bone cyst. From USA, concomitant fibrous dysplasia and aneurysm and bone cyst. Here it starts like this, it goes like this. From fibrous dysplasia of the frontal bone, like this, started with fibrous dysplasia, and then we develop this aneurysm and bone cyst. Another tumor, a common tumor to have the aneurysm bone cyst inside is osteoblastoma. Osteoblastoma is a benign disease or benign tumor, but then you can develop the aneurysm bone cyst inside. This is from Italy, from Roberto Delfini. <clears throat> a huge occipital osteoblastoma like this in a neurosmal bone cyst inside from China. Frontoparietal osteoblastoma with secondary neurosmal bone cyst. So fibrous dysplasia and osteoblastomas. Uh, diagnostic channels when you have both, of course, it is uh, problematic things. So South Africa, 2019. From India, again, a recent paper, osteoblastoma with aneurysmal bone cysts. Remember, this is a disease of young age of childhood and adults, young adults. Uh, chondroblastoma is another a lesion whereby you start with chondroblastoma and then you develop an aneurysmal bone cyst. And these are histologically verified. So this is not fake medicine. This is uh, documented medicine. Aneurysmal bone cyst in a child with history of acute lymphoblastic leukemia. So you have the bone lesion and then you develop something inside it. This is from Turkey. What about the histopathology of these lesions? I think Dr. Uh, Professor is not here, so we'll uh, just move until he comes in and go back. Remember that uh, an original bone cyst can affect any bone in your body. And the locations, the, the commonest location are lung bones and pelvis. But it can affect any bone in your body, mostly the lung bones. Upper limb, humerus, lower limbs, femur, you can get these. And the characteristic of these lesions is that they have multiple fluid levels. They're called fluid, fluid level. And the cranium, it can affect many sides, frontal or temporal. So frontal is a common site. And again, if you look here and show this X-ray to any resident during the exam, he will tell you that this is hemangioma. So it looks like hemangioma, but it is not. Again, in a child, intradibloic frontal bone aneurysmal cyst. And this is the bone with the aneurysmal bone cyst inside it as they removed it. <coughs> And this is in the anterior fossa, invading the anterior fossa completely from USA. It can affect the orbit like this. <coughs> Another paper from India about orbital involvement. And these cases, they're not good for the 
uh, oculoblastic surgeon to do it. This is the field of a neurosurgeon. So orbital surgery is the main domain for neurosurgeon and not oculoblastic uh, ophthalmologists. Temporal bone, sphenoid bone, sphenoid anaclitis, paranasal sinuses, any bone. And uh, ENT would face such cases. They are rare, but they can face it. Ethmoid bone. Again, another huge uh, one in the ethmoid. Mandible from Spain. Occiput, like this here. And that ruptured after head trauma and it's presented with hemorrhage. Again, occipital bone cyst. Again, if you look at this, you will see, oh, this is histocytic uh, xenocranulosis. Another giant occipital aneurysmal bone cyst from Germany, a recent paper. <clears throat> Can it occur inside the skull and not being attached to the skull completely inside the brain? The answer is yes. So intracranial, intradural, aneurysmal bone cysts like this, totally inside the brain. Another paper from USA about intracranial, intradural, and aneurysmal bone cysts. It can affect the petrous bone. Look at the destruction it causes. And again, as I said, this is a paper about the ethmoid ones. And another one affecting the jugular foramen. And in these cases, most people would go thinking of glomus jugulari. <clears throat> Cerebral ventana angle, one of the differential diagnoses, though rare. <clears throat> Common stage in the cerebral ventana angle are vestibular schwannoma, meningioma, and epidermoid. In the spine, uh, this is a paper from Mohammed uh, Zalili from Turkey. It's a beautiful paper. I enjoyed reading it. And he says that it's, the lesion could be extra osseous in the soft tissue or inside the bone, superficial or deep inside the bone, or extradural or intradural. Hamid Zalili is a world famous in spine from Turkey. So in the spine, it can be in 15% of the population. It affects mainly lumbar, cervical, and actually equally distributed. Sacrum is the, the last to be affected. But remember, it could affect the bone or soft tissue. Characteristically, it does not affect the disc space. Examples of these aneurysmal bone cysts in the cervical spine, and look at this huge thing, and the multiple fluid fluid levels. Here, the same thing, destroying the bone. and the cervical spine, anterior and posterior, from UK, from Neil Ashwood, from Tunisia, and as I said, uh, North Africa, Tunisia, and Morocco are very active in publication, much more than the Asian counterparts. We mentioned that. Uh, again, the aneurysmal bone cyst of the C1, C2, the amount of destruction it causes. Here in the thoracic spine, can present with spinal cord uh, compression. Uh, this is a very cute paper about vertebral plana caused by aneurysmal bone cyst. Look at the vertebral plana here. 
And here again, it is punched out osteolytic lesion affecting the lumbar spine or the sacral spine. As, remember, as we said, sacrum is the least affected in the spine. Here, soft tissue mainly, but again, it is extending into the bone. So you can get extra osseous aneurysmal bone cysts. What's the treatment of these cases? Yes, please. Please do. Just as a point of review, what you just to remember that uh, ABC can present an absent pedic, one of the differential diagnoses are absent pedic. ABC can invade more than one vertebra, can invade two vertebra continuous. ABC can extend to the ribs. These are, in, in addition to what Dr. Brian said about vertebra plana, these are rare presentation of ABC of the spine. ABC of the spine is much difficult diagnosis than the in the skull. In the skull, it is very evident, you can see it, but in the spine, it is much difficult, and the differential diagnosis is much wider. And usually, as we say, it starts on the posterior element rather than on the vertebral. Thank you. That was Dr. Azman Hadidi, Chief of the Radiology at Jordan University Hospital. Uh, what's the treatment? Surgery is the mainstay. As in all the tumors, don't think of biopsies and radiotherapy. It is not on in any type of surgery. So here, you want to go for the kill, and the best surgery you can do is total resection of the lesion. But with this propose you, whenever possible and applicable. Sometimes in the skull base, you cannot do that. Biopsy is not recommended because it can cause bleed. So the aim of surgery is radical excision. Is the doctor Farsa here? Yes. Oh, okay, you can, before we go into surgery, you can comment on the histology. Um, sorry for, for being there first. It took me 20 minutes to reach from the fifth circle to the fourth circle. Anybody who came this probably there is crash. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, uh, this is uh, 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 to, come to talk about uh, aneurysmal bone cyst. This is uh, very important lesion and very important for pathologists to recognize very important for neurosurgeon really know how to treat. Uh, one of the cases that I did probably 20 years ago, about about five, uh, child was five years old. Uh, we did for him uh, CT guided finding the aspiration, and uh, I diagnosed him as a neurosmal bone cyst, it was in cervical spine. The surgeon, uh, neurosurgeon, uh, did. Uh, Everything for him, and it was also a neurosmal bone cyst. But then the patient probably did not do proper fixation. The patient uh, developed uh, uh, complications, and probably Dr. Ibrahim can elaborate why this, in this cervical spine they do the complications, they don't do fixation. And uh, they took the specimen from me and they reviewed to another, another pathologist. And the other pathologist called it, called it giant cell tumor of the bone. I mean, this is a very big mistake because giant cell tumors, that they don't occur below 10 years of age. Uh, but just to satisfy the neurosurgeon that this is more aggressive tumor, it's not his, not to blame him and to blame the pathologist. Anyhow, this is an interesting story that happened with me with aneurysmal bone cyst. So I want to tell you what is the real pathology that we see. As you can see, this is usually doesn't come in one piece, but this is one of the cases that came, and this is multiple bone tissue, and uh, you can see spaces with the blood in them, and there are some solid areas, but this is typical. You can see cystic spaces with the blood. And <clears throat> this is what you see microscopically. These are the spaces. Uh, filled with the blood, and you can see many, many giant cells, even at this low power view, and the spindle cells. 
And these osteoclast-like giant cells, what made the, our pathologist early on to call it uh, giant cell tumor, uh, which was a very wrong diagnosis at that time. And these are the uh, cystic spaces, and these are the giant cells and multispindle cells. These cystic spaces, they are not lined by endothelial cells. That's why really they bleed very easily because they are not real uh, in uh, vascular spaces. We can see how this is very vascular and it are lined by fibrous tissue, compressed fibrous tissue and many giant cells. This is low power. This is again, you can see the cystic spaces in here and uh, laminated spaces, a lot of blood vessels or vascular spaces. Again, you can see here and you can see how many giant cells are there. This is typical. Can, you can see sometimes osteoplastic for, or storage formation, as you can see in here. This is higher power to see the osteoclast type giant cells. It's, they are, it's very important to recognize that they are osteoclast type uh, that you present. And uh, these are the spindle cells in there. And these are the vascular spaces or the blood spaces that are filled with the blood. Again, you can see many fibrin and blood spaces and many, many giant cells. Uh, this is wrongly can be misdiagnosed as giant cell tumor. You can see here many giant cells, many vascular, many spaces that are lined by spindle cells, not by endothelial cells. If you do endothelial markers, it's negative in these areas. This is typical uh, low power, higher power view. You can see the osteoclast type giant cells and the and the spindle cells are there, are there. Usually, they are bland and not atypical. Again, you can see the many osteoclast type giant cells with vascular uh, or blood spaces, uh, many uh, spindle cells, benign looking. These are typical osteoclast type giant cells. These are the ones that resorb, resorb the bone. And probably this is why the bone is resorbed because it's being, being activated and uh, getting the bone resorbed and forming cyst. Uh, so this is what a neurosis would more systemic and histology. Thank you. So about 95% are the usual cysts, and 5% are totally solid. The, answer, the question is... Okay. So surgery, as we said, is the mainstay. It's... Uh, in block radical resection, don't take biopsies, don't refer to radiotherapy. Surgery, if you cannot do radical excision, is to do curettage and bone grafting, or you can use high speed burr drill to shave the affected bone, or by using the electrocutary, the high frequency electric currents. Let's see some of the surgery that is done in the cranium. Sorry? Yes, absolutely right. Absolutely right. Uh, paper from my friend Dr. Gowell from India, another giant of uh, neurosurgeon from India. Uh, and they operated on this, excised it, and then the cerebellum herniated. So they're warning of this complication. Uh, endoscopy came in. And lots of cases can be done by endoscope, and I keep saying that in endoscopy lies the future of neurosurgery. In very short time, a decade or two, most of the cases will be done by an endoscope. It's no more that you put the endoscope into the ventricle. They are going into solid areas, uh, like the tergopalatine fossa and so on. So this is uh, from Turkey, and this is from Ireland again. Uh, doing the endoscopy excision of these, uh, this lesion. And the spine, you can do whatever approach you like, anterior approach, cerebral approach, both approaches. 
excise the lesion in the way we mentioned, the radical excision or curettage and bone grafts, and then you may need to do instrumentation for stabilization. Paper from USA, from the Children's Hospital in Boston, Harvard, uh, summarizing their experience in these cases. In children, remember this is a disease of childhood and early adulthood. So here you are, showing this and the fixation. Another case, they put a cage to fix here. Same thing, fixation using nuts. Here they are fixing the cranium uh, to the spine. Now these kind of cases are less and less than this kind of stabilization. Again, in children, this is the same thing from France. Here they're using cage and plate and screws, anterior and posterior fixation. So it is a tumor. It is not a joke. It's not ABC, blah, 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 ABC, ABC. It's not, it's difficult kind of pathology. Cervical spine in children from USA again. And this is from uh, Mayo Clinic, Rochester, Minnesota. Again, the type of fixation they are using. Remember, this is 2011, and this kind of fixation is rarely used now. And the thoracic area, the same thing. You excise and then you fix. Thoracic pathology fixation by rods. And again, here, a similar case where they I found this endosmal process with osteoblastoma and the fixation. Lumbar spine being fixed after excision. So, surgery, 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 whether it is open surgery or endoscopy. Uh, radiotherapy for very limited uh, indication, recurrent, progressive, or inoperable. Not as upfront treatment like most mediocre surgeons would do, is to take a biopsy and send for radiotherapy. <coughs> Uh, the role of radiotherapy in recurrent and original bone cysts in the temporal bone, they have done the, the surgery and then they have given radiotherapy. Again, the role of radiotherapy in, in the original bone cyst, and this is three years after. There is some pacification or solidification of the cyst. Radiation therapy for original bone cysts, again, from USA. Uh, published in the American Journal of Clinical Oncology, they have put the papers and the duration and the dose of radiation. They can put radionuclide nucleide ablation inside the lesions like this, and it, as I said, it will solidify. Mega voltage radiotherapy using 20 to 60 grays. This is in the clavicle, and this is how it looks after radiation. So it has a role, but it is limited. There is a new concept now, is to do embolization. As we are talking, this is vascular, so why not to embolize? This can be done before surgery to decrease bleeding during surgery, or you do it as the main state treatment. You just do it to cure the disease, or it could be palliative in cases where you cannot do anything. Examples of embolization. Spinal embolization is a tricky uh, business. Again, here on the cervical spine and the embolization. The material that it is used for embolization variable, whether it is small balls or small fluid, liquid fluid, etc. etc. Uh, this is again an original process with embolization. Uh, N-butyl cyanoacrylate using embolization, spinal embolization. From Italy, selective arterial embolization in 36 patients using N-2-butyl cyanoacrylate. 63, uh, sorry, 36 patients. And their conclusion was arterial embolization may be the treatment of choice. Embolization is less invasive, lower cost, simpler procedure than surgery, and easily repeatable. 
all different sides instead of like the side of the job. All types. But again, you have to select your cases. So some of the cases they put, look at this before immunization and look how it looks later on. Again, cervical spine with embolization, non embolization, it has a good effect. In fact, embolization is now overcoming surgery as one of the mainstay of treatments. This is uh, embolization in sacral type. You can see how it looks before and after. And another new tricks coming up is to inject something inside it. It's called sclerotherapy. You use alcohol, you use calcitonin, you use methylprednisolone, deoxycycline, concentrated bone marrow. These have all been tried with various degrees of success. Sclerotherapy. This is injecting alcohol, certain type of alcohol. And look at this before, after, before and after. This is in the upper end of the tibia. Sorry. Yes. What's that? It's just causing, it's just cause, causing thrombosis. Yes. It has a bone affinity to Yes. And binds to the bone. True. And sclerosis. true. Biophosphonate, look at this here, and three months later, it's solidified. Here, before treatment, three months after, it's solidified. So, in addition to surgery, we have other options. But currently, the main, the, the first indication of the first treatment is embolization followed by injection followed by surgery. Uh, this is a paper about concentrated bone marrow used to put inside. And their conclusion was, uh, this is from Heidelberg, Germany. Uh, although embolization can still be considered the first line treatment of ABC, new promising therapeutic procedures involving the use of mesenchymal still cells are developing. Ala Adasi, do you have any experience with this? Ala, oh, but, uh, is, it, is it hitting the literature? Uh, this is one of the cases that they use bone marrow injection. This is the response at four months. And look at the very good response, 18 months. Most of these injections, they need repeated procedures. You need to repeat the injections, not once. It's the same like embolization. You need to do it repeatedly. Uh, this is calcitonin and methylprednisolone. Very, very safe method. And they prove that it causes really good response here. Can they regress on their own spontaneously? Yes, but that is extremely rare. So don't count on this. Don't tell your patient, oh, some people it disappeared before we have a treatment because this is very rarely encountered in literature and it only happens in very few old patients. Uh, my personal series in these uh, uh, pathologies. Uh, this is uh, one of the cases of the spine. Here many patients, 17 year old came with paraplegia and look at the cyst that he had destroying the bone the lamina the particle and so on and i treated him with uh, just surgical excision i did not need to do any embolization immobilization but this is a very good response you can see the cord here before we could not see it and he was able to walk and he went with this color uh, as a form of immobilization. Immobilization. I say this in the cranial uh, department is more. Uh, these are all cases of mine, mostly concentrated in this sphenoid uh, orbit, ethmoid, etc. etc. I selected one case for you. Uh, this boy, seven-year-old from Iraq, 
we came with this proptosis. You can see the deviation, not only proptosis, but pushed downwards. And if you look at him from above, you can see the bulge, but the best way is to look tangentially. This is the only way to really detect minute or minor cases of, of proptosis. This way, if it is large, you can see it. This way, if it is little, you will see it. And there was some limitation with his eye movements. Uh, Dr. Ibrahim Sadat, are you around? Good evening. So I had the pleasure to see this uh, lovely, and I mean it, lovely kid who came from Iraq with this uh, disfiguring uh, uh, proptosis. And um, at that time, uh, preoperatively, uh, there was right optic neuropathy and there was proptosis. Uh, um, the structure of the optic disc at that time was normal. And that means that we can save it. If we do uh, something, I mean surgical, we can uh, save it. So I think that's what uh, was done at that time. So, uh, this was uh, his uh, OCT. The optic nerve is still good. There is no red areas in the optic disc. We have post uh, So, these are his images. You can see this uh, complex lesion involving the uh, tibial fossa, the ethmoid bone, going into the maxilla here, uh, going to the nasal cavity. So it is really challenging. Uh, this is the CT scan. You can see the amount of bony destruction here, mainly involving the ethmoid. Here we are going into the maxilla, maxillary sinus, completely destroying it. And here we're going into the sphenoid. Sagittal section showing you the distribution, as we said. And this is 3D, and this is the angiogram, this is the venogram, which is part and parcel of the investigations. I would not do a MRI alone without a MRI MRB for any person. But look at the, the lesion again. Yes, please. Sorry? Yes, this uh, we will we mention it. This patient, we'll discuss this patient. Yes, yes. Again, you may say easy, this is uh, an original bone so the diagnosis is quite clear. It's not. Let me show you. And I have selected my cases where the lesion is very much similar to the uh, pathology here enclosed. This actually is not mine, this is uh, from the book. But this is my fibroma, chondromaxoid fibroma, angiofibroma, neurofibroma, histocytosis, Iraqi patient of mine, intraosseous meningioma. Patient came from Kurdistan. Seen orbital meningioma. This is local Jordanian patient came with this huge lesion. Uh, Hemangiopericytoma, epidermoid, fibrous dysplasia, mucosil. And we presented this case in the other um, department. Giant cell granuloma, fungal infection. This is a patient from Libya who came with this extensive uh, fungal infection. And he was not immunocompromised. Allergic sinusitis, uh, Dr. Mahmoud Asad loved to have this diagnosis, allergic sinusitis. Echinococcus granulosus, very weird site for the pathology here. Inflammatory pseudotumor. Sinonasal carcinoma, a patient of mine from Syria, adenocystic carcinoma from Iraq, adenocarcinoma from uh, Sudan. Undifferentiated carcinoma here from Jordan, 
Eunice Arcama in Jordan, in esophageal carcinoma, fibrous dysplasia, patient of mine, and the fibroma, it's not my patient. Jane Cellular Manilloma is one of my patients. And this patient who comes to me or came to me from Jerusalem, he has a coffee there. And in spite of all uh, they are facing there, he had a very good sense of humor. And you can see this extensive, very much aneurysmal bone cyst like thing. This is the neuroblastoma. Look at this. This is typical of aneurysmal bone cyst. Chondrosarcoma, typical of, of this. Osteoma, osteoblastoma, amyloblastoma, osteosarcoma, raptomyosarcoma, and giant cell tumors. Is this a mental exercise? No. These are actual cases, and every doctor dealing with these cases should know them. Clivus cordoma, a patient of mine from Libya, chondrosarcoma, metastasis, lymphoma, as we mentioned previously. We mentioned the disease of blastoma, spine cordoma, we mentioned. Uh, this is my point here, the fluid, fluid level. People say this is pathognomonic of aneurysmal bone cyst. The answer is big no. Many other lesions can present with fluid fluid levels, in addition to the ABC, like chondroblastoma, osteosarcoma, and cesiblastoma. And here you are. Janssen granuloma, chondromyxoid, fungal infection, fibrous dysplasia, cesiblastoma, anemia. And this actually interesting case, we published this in the Arab Journal of Neurosurgery a few years back. It looks like an original bone cyst. It was just sickle cell anemia. Uh, uh, so, what is a medical oncologist doing in an ABC uh, session? Well, it's exactly this. Before we go through the differential diagnosis, this is distinct from the association between an erosion bonuses and other tumors. It can be either a degeneration of the tumors into it or vice versa. But these are actually, and th these are well characterized in the literature as very beautifully summarized by Professor Speer. These are actual cases that look like an erosion bonuses. And the implications therapeutically are absolutely tremendous. Histocytosis, which could very easily look like an isomeric bone cyst and would be treated radically differently. Uh, meningioma, where the main uh, uh, modality would be surgery uh, uh, and then uh, close observation unless we resort to radiotherapy later on. Now, I can't emphasize the importance of not missing something that would be treated with antifungals or antibiotics uh, 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 like a fungal infection. Um, because it would be really a pity to leave a uh, fungal infection patient die uh, uh, needlessly this way. Ewing sarcoma can present in this manner, and Ewing sarcoma, sarcoma is not one disease, of course, and Ewing sarcoma, the mainstay of treatment would be alternating high phosphonide based regimen with an uh, alkylator based uh, uh, regimen for um, four months to six months before going to surgery and then completing the course of uh, uh, treatment for a year. Uh, we may resort to radiotherapy in between if they are truly inoperable by an expert surgeon. There's a fragile carcinoma where the mainstay of treatment would be concomitant chemotherapy with radiotherapy to, follow, to, be, to be followed by chemotherapy alone. And that treatment is given with curative intent. Chondrosarcoma, where the mainstay is going to be surgery because radiotherapy doesn't work, chemotherapy doesn't work, nothing works except the attempt of, of, uh, of maximizing the excision. And there is nothing in common between osteosarcoma and chondrosarcoma. These are two different tumors. And again, the mainstay is surgery, but the uh, treatment chemotherapy-wise would be radically different after that. Rhabdomyosarcoma in this location where Multimodality chemotherapy, aggressive chemotherapy may achieve uh, remarkable results either preoperatively or in the adjuvant setting. And giant cell tumor where using antisorptive agents like the musumab or the like can have remarkable uh, uh, results uh, in, uh, 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 as, as a consequence. Uh, 
metastasis and I cannot emphasize enough the importance of not missing a clear met or an unclear met that could have been detected and spared the patient a lot of hassle uh, in, a, in a neurosurgical procedure. Lymphoma were depending upon which one of the hundreds or so lymphomas it is, if this is a prognosis lymphoma, the mainstay of treatment would be high dose methotrexate in an attempt to delay radiotherapy as much as possible and actual surgical section is not needed. These are actual cases and we could, anemia in, in this case and in, in when, when you have a huge demand on, on bone marrow compensation like in, in bad sickle cells or in bad thalassemia, thalassemia major, where you can get expansion of the bone marrow all over the place. This is not a usual site. Usually um, um, uh, thalassemics, thalassemia major patients will have the classic uh, maxillary prominence. But this unilateral uh, uh, way of expression is an extremely interesting one. But again, this is a true association. Now back to the question of, of using in, in therapeutically something like bone marrow injections. The association between uh, hematopoietic stem cells and stem cells of the bone uh, is extremely interesting because hematopoietic stem cells ideally have the ab ability to transdifferentiate to uh, a lot of other cell lines. Uh, most, uh, not least of uh, uh, important of which would be uh, uh, the uh, the bone cells because of the close uh, proximity between the hematopoietic stem cells and their niche, which is formed by bone. Having said this, there's a difference of, of studying the ability of differentiation uh, of hematopoietic stem cells or the mesenchymal stem cells or multipotent progenitor cells available in the bone marrow. And I spent half my adult life studying this in the Stem Cell Institute in Minnesota. And the quackery that goes around of injecting bone marrows uh, in anywhere you see as a, as a source of potential stem cells without any attempt of quantifying or purifying your stem cells and not knowing what you are achieving. And probably the only thing you're achieving is, is inflammation because of introduction of a, of a foreign uh, material, uh, which unfortunately this form of quackery is, uh, is prevalent throughout the world. Uh, these are actual cases, and these are actual points that we continue to hammer on a daily basis. Thank you. So, the, the biggest limit of the ABC is the hemiplegic osteosarcomas. It came the same appearance. The biggest limit for the ABC is the hemiplegic part of osteosarcomas. It came with the same name, same appearance. Thank you. Uh, just um, what's of wisdom for the junior staff? You need to think of one, not one, 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 one pathology. You need to think of multiple pathologies. Before showing you well, the, the last, the, the end of the, the session, we'll just show you the video. But before doing that, I'm going to refresh your memory about the anatomy of that part so that it will be easy to follow the, the video. Now, neurosurgery teaching and the Arab world makes the neurosurgeon not interested at all in understanding the nose or the eyes or the neck. And I just cannot think of a gynecologist doing cesarean section without having the knowledge of abdominal structures. He should know what the ureters are, what the common iliac are, and so on and so forth. So a neurosurgeon and the other board is not asked to know these kind of anatomy. It is the same skull, the ENT, the ophthalmology, the facial maxillary, and the neck. It's part and parcel of your department, especially if you have a case of head injury when things are mixed. So, orbit, again, this is a neurosurgical field and it should be mastered by the neurosurgical residents. Orbit is made of seven bones with seven arteries and seven veins. We don't want to dwell on that, but we are concentrating on this pathology of this boy uh, with the region. So you have to understand the anatomy of the nose, the turbinates and the, the septum. You have to understand all the anatomy of the muscles around the eye. And you have to understand the anatomy of the lacrimal apparatus, the superior inferior canaliculi leading to the lacrimal sac, which opens underneath the inferior turbinate. So you have to know this if you want to operate in that area. 
And you have to understand that if you cut the medial canthal ligament, then you can go into the medial part of the orbit. And here is the nasolacrimal uh, sac conduct. And here, if you do that, you will find the anterior ethmoidal artery. So all these structures will be faced during this surgery. The sphenoid bone, which is the central bone. The most difficult bone is the temporal, but ethmoid is the central. And lots of people don't recognize that it's made of body and two wings, the third wing, and the later wing, and then two feet, medial and lateral tenoids that articulate with the palate. Again, the relationship with the orbit, with the optic nerve and the muscles arising from the annular subzen, in relation to the maxillary sinus, in relation to the infraorbital nerve, in relation to the ethmoid cells of the lacrimal sign, the terminus is mandatory. Again, the overall anatomy picture. <clears throat> so, this is the surgery planning, of course. Uh, don't think of yourself as the master of everything, nobody is. This is a multi uh, disciplinary uh, surgery, so you need the fish muscular surgeon, you need an anesthetist, you need so many disciplines around you. And this is the planned session, and there's such a main lines. And this is the incision, and as you deep it, you will come across the nasal lacrimal duct and tank here, going into the underneath inferior turbulence. So this is the function of the facial maxillary surgeon to open this for me, and then it is my uh, heavy-hearted uh, duty to go into this tumor, to go into the base of the skull. Uh, it's nice and helpful to use the navigation. Your brain is your navigator, but the presence of navigation would help you. Just to tell you that you are on the right track, but I always say, if I am at uh, confrontation with the machine, I dismiss the machine and count on my anatomy knowledge. But if we both agree, I say I am here at the anterior climate process, and the navigation the machine confirms it, uh, this is nice. If it doesn't, I disregard it and continue uh, according to my anatomy and knowledge. Navigation can be wrong. Absolutely. It happened many, many, many times. But as I said, it is a good tool. It confirms where you are. And it's good for the juniors to start with. Let's see the surgery. And to see the surgery, we will show you. This is the last piece of the uh, delivery of uh, the uh, seminar this evening. Uh, we will see it in 2D on the big screen, and you'll see it on 3D on the small screen. Uh, you can look here, you can look there, whatever you like. But the 3D would show you the depth, and that is very important. We have been using this 3D for some time, and I'm proud to say that in Fara Hospital we have this facility. We have the latest microscope, the robotic microscope, with the 3D ability. So we record it and we transmit it and we teach uh, our residents uh, about the anatomy. It is a must. 3D now is a must in any good neurosurgical unit. Can you check your Googles that it is functioning? Yes, when, when, when you go in, you have your, your mind set on something. My mind was set on aneurysm and bone cyst, but I'm ready to hear with any pathology there is. And most importantly, the anatomical knowledge and the experience in that area. This is not a place for the juniors. This is not a place for speedy Gonzalez's. This is not a space for the, uh, you know. Yes. yes. No, no. And then, yes, and, and there was history of trauma. Actually, there was a cut wound in that area. Are we ready? This is a primary uh, nervous malpulse, secondary to trauma. Trauma induced the changes we mentioned, and then you develop a change. Like many germs, it can be caused by trauma.
once we finish the video, this will be the end of the lecture. So bear with me until we finish that. So can you put uh, off the lights, please? So you can see, this is a tumor. This is not a cyst. There are spaces with blood in it. Again, this is not a cyst. This is misnomer. It's a tumor. And if you don't remove that tumor, then the life of the boy would be destroyed. So here you are. Imagine your son or daughter is there. What would you do? And how would you think of the surgeons doing it? You drill more bones. These are eaten bones, but you want to clarify the pigeon? The tumor is a mixed bony, and it is really rather soft to firm. Again, if I did not have the anatomy knowledge of the nose and the orbits, I should not be operating there. And I've been trained as a neurosurgeon to know this. I've trained with ENT surgeons and with ophthalmic surgeons, and that gave me the advantage. There are spaces, there are some blood here, etc. You want to preserve the nasolacrimal sac and duct, and you want to preserve the infraorbital nerve, so called nerve of kissing. And most importantly, you want to preserve the anterior cranial fossa, and you want to preserve the optic nerves, and so on. So I'm looking here to find the plane of equilibrium between the tumor and the dura. We know the dura is not there, the, the bone is not there. So maybe if I can find the plane of equilibrium, then I can. Uh, here's the attachment to the dura. So I'm trying to dislocate it from the dura. The dura is tough. It is resistant to invasion. I'm not going to show you the whole film uh, or even the modified form, but just to show you, you know, give you the taste of what this looks like. This is the dura here. This is the dura of the anterior fossa. So I'm trying to peel it off without opening the dura. If I open it, you will get meningitis because we are in that contact with the, all the nasal organisms and the outside organisms. I'm using the tough scissor because it is tough bone or shells of bone. Here I am into this sphenoid sinus. Again, you have to imagine where is the sphenoid sinus is. And I say to myself, I am in the sphenoid sinus. Give me the marker. I put the marker. I say, yes, I am indeed in the sphenoid sinus. If the marker says, no, you are in another place, I say, get out of the room. I'm going to continue on my own. So this is the cavity of the sphenoid sinus. And if you go there, you will find the anterior climate process. And if you open it, you will go into the optic nerve inside the optic canal. And of course, the pituitary gland. So this boy's life is in my hands. And this is a great responsibility, a burden that really give you uh, 10 years of age every time you do it. His family are waiting outside. I don't know what's the result of this, but I'm going to take this tumor out completely. I'm not going to suffice with just taking a biopsy and say, oh, this is difficult, blah, blah, blah. We discover that it is attached to the dura. We discover that it is attached to this, that, and the other. This is just an excuse of mediocre surgeons who want to show in front of the results that they are good. They are not. They are just creating excuses. Of course. What do you think? So we just move it on.
Here I had a bleeding, and I left it for you to see. This is from the ethmoidal artery. Here it is. If you allow it to slip, it will go into the intracranially into the orbit. I mean, into the orbit, and then it is a disaster. So anterior and posterior ethmoidal arteries are to be respected. See, the scissor is barely able to cut through this rather firm tumor. So here we are, I'm putting the marker, and the marker tells me you are at the anterior line out process. The bone is intact. Hemostase is cleaning up. This is the dura of the anterior canine fossa. If you open it, you'll go into the frontal bone. So we continue surgery, make sure there is good hemostasis, put some gel foam to prevent bleeding, and then off. <clears throat> yeah. We use this glue to prevent any CSF leak because you don't know whether you have opened uh, a nick in the dura, so you want to make sure that you don't have CSF leak. Yes, they are slow growing, yes. But again, this excuse given by mediocre surgeon that, oh, we have removed 80%, so 20% that needs 20 years to come back. You will see it. <laughs> so this is the incision, eyebrow incision, here it is. And this is him coming to the clinic for a follow-up. But look at this. There's no protrusions. And the eye socket went back. And this is the MRI. One year. Normal. No residual of any kind in that area. And this is the last time we saw him. Very good cosmetic appearance. With this, we finish and we thank you. <laughs> any questions, any comments are more than welcome. Um, hello, Dr. Ibrahim. Uh, it was not reported, but I would say, why not? If the, there is a trauma to the abdomen of the mother, yes, maybe, yes. Because trauma is a very strong. Uh, background of these kinds of tumors. If there are no more questions, we thank you and this was the question here. Okay. So what's the final recommendation for uh, spinal now? Is it uh, in place for canning area? If the patient has problems with the progress of neurodegenerative sick or spinal instability for the tumor, we do surgery and fixation. Uh, we had the painful syndrome to go to mobilization. Can we actually special recommendation? Yes. The main presentation of the ABC is pain, which is the main, the main kind of complaint, swelling in that area, especially in the face, or neurological deficits, or most importantly, pathological fracture. So taking all these into account, you decide what kind of approach you do. If there is a fracture, then you need to fix, then you do surgery. If there are no neurological deficits and you have the leisure of time, then try to use the immobilization or the injection. Can we use immobilization and injection? Yes, you can. Some people try that. If you have a question, if you have a question, uh, if I cannot reach the final diagnosis, I would go anyway. I would go in and uh, sometimes you can't. And you said biopsy is really dangerous, it can cause more bleed. So if you cannot really find a final decision, then you should go in prepared for the worst. Like for any surgery, when I go in, I'm prepared for carotid artery rupture. 
So I have all the aneurysms set around me so that I can clip the, the breathing site. Okay, if there are no, no more questions, next time we will discuss the giant invasive pituitary lesions. And I speak giant, I have the largest giant pituitary lamas in the world. Maybe the same like me, maybe together is Atul Hul from India. But you know, you compare the population of India with the population of Jordan. So we have the largest series of giant invasive pituitary adenomas. And again, pituitary adenomas are thought of like ABC, a simple thing. Pituitary adenomas are what? They are really ugly tumors. The adenomas are ugly tumors. So we have to point that out. Thank you. See you next week. Hello. Hello, Dr. Ibrahim. I'm uh, Marco Meloni, neurosurgeon from Italy. I'm the moderator uh, part of the journey uh, outside. Uh, first of all, I want to congratulate you for your presentation. Very nice case. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes, please. Uh, so I ask to all the panelists, everybody, uh, somebody has some question for Dr. Ibrahim. Shindo, Saad, Mehem, nobody. So I have a question for you, Dr. Ibrahim. Uh, in, in this uh, unreasonable bone space, uh, if you find some adherence with the drum adder, you, usually you do duroplasty, or you just remove the retinal bone and then check after radiotherapy. No, I would go for a final radical excision. Whether it is secondary to any tumor, I would go for radical excision. So I remove the whole lot, the aneurysm and the underlying bone. Okay, perfect. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Okay, well, I can conclude here. Thank you, Thank you very much. So we'll see you next week. And again, we are going to present a very unique series of giant aggressive pituitary tumors. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.